it is our power to change the world that our children live in. Would you like to say a few words to your fans, Michael? Anything else? I'm happy to be here. How does it feel to be meeting the royalty tonight? <laughs> Very right. exciting. I think there's this huge stigma attached to anybody who's a little bit different than someone else. Michael was totally misunderstood by so many people. I love you very much. Thank you. There's an image that the media, I think, want you to have of him. People think they know the myth of Michael Jackson. They all think they know Michael Jackson. Good entertainment. Oh, you... <laughs> He's out of this world. There's God, then there's Michael. <laughs> Michael Jackson was the king of pop for a reason. Driven, eccentric, and revolutionary. He's become a myth. And despite his death, remains one of the biggest stars of the 20th century. He inspired the world, but still remains for most of us an enigma. Very few people really know the real Michael. Who was Michael Jackson? Behind the mask? Behind the image? Who was the man in the mirror? Michael Jackson's music career began when he was only five. He was a child star. The Jackson Five, formed by their father Joe, became a worldwide sensation in 1969. But behind the scenes, Joe subjected the boys to physical and emotional abuse, especially Michael. His methods were cruel. He pushed Michael very hard and his success never seemed to be enough. Michael said his father embarrassed him, calling him Big Nose. He was terrified of him. That had such an impact on the way Michael saw himself. Sometimes he would fear seeing his own father. Just, just looking at his own father would bring this um, feeling of doom and you know just bring this anxiety on him. So it had a massive, massive impact what, uh, the way he was brought up by his father. I mean, the, the treatment of Joseph Jackson on the brothers had a positive impact on the stage. Um, it made them one of the most successful bands ever. It made Michael Jackson, well, it didn't make, it, Joseph Jackson didn't make Michael Jackson, but um, he was certainly very pivotal in the making of Michael Jackson. Michael's mother, Catherine Jackson, stated that although whipping is considered abuse by today's standards, it was a common way to discipline children in the 60s. But while some kids are able to withstand such harshness, the whippings deeply traumatized Jackson, although he appeared to be a tough young man. His youth was lonely and isolated. Out of all the brothers, he is the most sensitive. He, he's the, he is the one I would say who's less built for a superstardom, other than like, uh, like Tito, who really couldn't care less what anyone would say about the Jermaine, he would take you on, you know, he was a tough cookie and Randy's tough and, you know, Michael was soft, he, he was gentle and, and he, he would find it very, very difficult on his own because he was the lead singer. He had to, on his plate, he had to sing, dance, but it made sure he was perfect so the other brothers could follow. But uh, it, it certainly had a, an impact on his life, but he never complained. As he grew up, Michael remained childlike and delicate. He looked at the world through the eyes of a child, and he loved spending time with children. To a child, he was just Michael, not the superstar millionaire. His favorite place was, of course, Neverland, a huge fantasy theme park that he had built in Santa Barbara, California. It was an escape, his sanctuary, a child's paradise, Michael Jackson's dream world. 
Neverland was a way for him to reconstruct the childhood he never had, but also a way to remind him of his roots. My kids absolutely adore Michael. But my two younger daughters, uh, Harriet and Olivia, came with me to Neverland and we spent a, a, about a week there. And they had access to everything, the, the cinema, the zoo, the fairground, all of Neverland with the chefs, they could have anything they wanted. And at the end of the week, I was with Michael and I'm prompted and I'm talking about, they would have been about eight, nine years old. And I said to them at the end of the week, I said, what was the best thing that you liked about Neverland? And they both turned around and said, the best thing about Neverland was being with Michael. He actually preferred the company of children because they had no prejudices. All kids would play happily together in this, not even naive, it's just an, an innocence, which Michael absolutely loved. There was no stigma attached to anyone, say, who was uh, disabled, uh, of their, the color of their skin, of their level of education. All children it was like a level playing field. And Michael reveled in that because it was of this total innocence. And Michael told me that he, or when he wrote his music, he tried to get into the mind of a 10 to 12 year old. And that's how he wrote his stuff, through the eyes of the children. He just saw this wonderful innocence in children. He wanted to be around children because they, he could trust them. You know, they didn't ask him silly questions. They didn't want to talk about Frillo all the time, about the moonwalk. They just wanted to treat him as Michael, so he could trust them a lot more. The obsession with childhood in general is because he believes that he didn't have one. So he wanted to compensate. He always used that word, compensate. I'm compensating for my lost childhood, for the childhood I never had. That's why he built Neverland. That was the place that he thought he could build so he could have everything he never had as a child. He would have been touring, he would have been with adults all the time. So his whole world is when he was, you know, from five to 10 years old, would have been an adult world. He wasn't allowed to do stuff that other kids did, like, you know, just muck around and play sport or go to school or go to the movies. I had a very interesting conversation once. So I remember it very well, because I learned a lot from it. And we were talking about the importance of how he feels to stay childlike. And he said to me, if you look at the most geniuses in the world, like he, he named a few, like Steven Spielberg and people like that. If you meet them, they, they are very childlike characters and they remain creative. When people are starting believing they're getting older, then they don't, they're not so creative anymore. So he made an effort to stay childlike. And that's how he believed he could, he could come up with hits after hit. Michael was kind and a practical joker, but he was complicated. He was shy, but he transformed on stage. He tried to eat healthy, but loved fries, popcorn, and ice cream. He was a vegetarian that didn't really like eating vegetables. And while he was always chasing perfection, he wasn't perfect, but that's what made him Michael. Michael loved his practical jokes, which were sometimes uh to the detriment of others. I remember one time we were in Los Angeles and we had driven back from Neverland and we were staying at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. So my kids were there, Michael's kids were there and Michael sent out for some water balloons. Anyway, they had all these little mini water balloons and they were filling them up with water in the, from the sink and they were throwing them out the window and they were hitting people with water and it was we I had visions of us all getting arrested and busted down to the local police station. My dad adored him. They met when they were 18. And that's what I mean, like Michael just thought it was absolutely hilarious. They were just throwing these water, water balloons off the balcony, hitting people underneath. <laughs> yeah, Michael was a priest. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way he was when he wanted to have some fun. He couldn't go out, he couldn't, we couldn't do nothing. If you sat down with Michael and tried to watch a movie, it, it would drive you mad because he would not shut up the whole time through it. He would say, he made a mistake. He should have shot it from that angle. Oh, I can't believe they've done it that way. The shadow of the light is not good enough. I'm like, Michael, will you be quiet? You know, and, and Mark would be laughing his head off and stuff, but 
he just couldn't sit down unless it was Bart Simpson or something like that, which he would be glued to. You wouldn't miss an episode of that, you know, but uh, other movies, he would find it hard. He's, he's majorly into Bruce Lee. And that used to drive me crazy too, because he literally knew every one of Bruce Lee's lines. So he would be, you're watching a Bruce Lee movie like Enter the Dragon and he would be saying all the lines. As you, as, like seriously, and doing the actions and stuff. And you're thinking, Michael, will you be quiet so I can actually focus on, on the film? Michael was completely different when he was on stage. They're an amazing showman. Electric, it, he was like, almost like super, like, I don't know, it was like the Hulk thing. It was a completely different guy. Uh, it's the incredible energy that he, he drew from the audience. And when Michael was on his own or with us, Privately, he was just very quiet, not insular, but uh, just a very mild-mannered, very quietly spoken guy. In the 1980s, he had become a musical phenomenon and was at the peak of his fame. He was a megastar, unique and inspiring, out of this world, he captivated all audiences. He was controversial, but his music was a celebration of diversity. Everyone was obsessed with him. He had class, he was sexy. I think to summarise him, he's probably the most talented musician of all time, the most famous person of all time, who was also seen by many people, and probably the people that matter most to Michael, as being one of the nicest people that's ever lived, they've ever met. When he did the history tour, I actually went to the history tour. You know, thousands and thousands of other people did. I stood there amongst 80,000 people and watched him perform. And I, I wanted to see that in action. I wanted to see that and, and emulate that and, and uh, try and learn something from him on stage to take away, to motivate me to, to be successful in my own business. Michael Jackson was the biggest success story for the American dream, basically, isn't it? Where he, he's gone from nothing, rags to riches, to the, the most famous man in the world. I remember once they did a survey and Michael got to hear about it, and he was smiling from ear to ear. He was so happy. And they were showing people pictures in New York of the current president at the time. And they were showing pictures of Michael Jackson. And they did a survey, who's the most recognizable? And it was Michael Jackson. And he was just over the moon, you know, by the whole thing. <laughs> From the age of 16, he had a growing uneasiness with his appearance. A lot of his fans seemed to be missing the cute young Michael Jackson and didn't seem to like him as much as he matured. He felt rejected. He didn't like being seen off stage. He wanted to remain mysterious and felt more comfortable when people wouldn't see him barefaced. The personality cult of Michael Jackson made him famous for his style, smooth dance moves and music, but deep down he was a fragile man. He admitted that he hated looking in the mirror, um, and that's partly why he wore the surgical masks for privacy, uh, so people didn't have to look at his face. Uh, he also said that, you know, if, if he could never be photographed, then he'd be the happiest man in the world. But he resented his own looks, and we can see how that manifested itself eventually, unfortunately. In, how Michael had plastic surgery and um, maybe took that too far at times. That all stemmed from that childhood and the way he was treated by uh, Joseph, especially being teased by your own father about your looks when you're less than 10 years old. I mean, of course it's going to have an impact. It just created an anxiety in Michael. 
In 1984, while performing Billie Jean for a Pepsi commercial shoot, a misfired pyrotechnic set Michael Jackson's hair on fire, and he suffered from severe second-degree burns to his scalp. Plastic surgery was required to restore his appearance, but nothing would ever be the same after this tragedy. Instead of suing Pepsi, he settled out of court for $1.5 million that he donated entirely to the burn unit of the Brotman Medical Center. That's how big his heart was. He wore a wig from here on. He also needed Demerol, a strong painkiller. That moment was a critical turning point in his life that led to his plastic surgery and drug addiction that would eventually kill him. Driving can kill a friend. Michael was not only a brilliant performer, he was an extraordinary humanitarian at heart. In 2000, he was cited by the Guinness Book of World Records as the most philanthropic pop star in history. His generosity and kindness was unlimited. He spent a good part of his life helping people with mental and physical health issues, especially disadvantaged children, and supporting the homeless. He spent hours in hospitals helping those in need and lifting spirits. He also donated for education rights, ecology, and refugees. He would turn up unannounced. The kids had no idea. He would have a sack full of toys, and he would go in, meet the kids, leave. And there was no big deal about it. Michael used to just do this off his own bat. And he'd probably do hospital visits at least once a month. He used to have loads of kids come up to Neverland and he used to bust them in. And sometimes Michael wasn't even there. These kids that usually, it's sick kids, uh, sometimes kids from poor backgrounds, would come in and they were escorted, like a school trip to Neverland. And um, they were just, uh, you know, it was just a great treat for these kids to come up, obviously, to spend time at Michael Jackson's place. In 1988, he gave a check of 300,000 British pounds to the royal family, Charles and Diana for the Princess's Trust, a charity supporting disadvantaged children. It is my honor to be here in South Africa. I love you people very much. I've had the time of my life here. I've had so much fun, I hate to leave. And I'm definitely looking for a, a home here, Dubai, because I would love to spend uh, the rest of my life here. And this is a wonderful, lovely man, and I love Nelson Mandela very much. And thank you for all your hospitality and all your love. His foundation, Heal the World, was created to help those in need all around the world, and a message for parents and adults that it was their duty and in their power to make the world a better place for future generations. This was in fact the message of his famous inspirational song, Man in the Mirror. He was head of many, many, many charities across the world for child poverty, for sick kids in Africa, a lot of charities, I think in Southeast Asia as well, in, in places of extreme poverty. It wasn't done for publicity, it was done because he felt that like he wanted to do it. He, you know, you'd watch something on TV that's negative, like uh, starving kids or something in Ethiopia, or if, we, if you'd hear about a sick sick child or, or so on, then he'd have tears rolling down his face. He'd want to do something about it. I lost my mother in 2012 to breast cancer. She was first diagnosed with breast cancer back in the year 2000. I told Michael about it, and I didn't really expect him to react too much about it at the time. Straight away, he said, gave me her phone number and he called her there and then in front of me and he said I'm going to stay in reg regular contact with your mother and he, to keep her spirits up, keep her positive and focusing for it and he would always call her no matter where he was in, his, in the world and I wouldn't prompt those calls, he did goodness out of his heart, he just remember I need to ring Matt's mum and they become very close on the phone you know and uh, 
who would take a great interest in her. And she used to credit him for being able to see my children grow up a lot more and to live to 2012. And it, sadly, she had to watch him pass away in 2009. But a very caring man. His charity work is unreported, and it's one of the things that really gets to me. He actually did a tour once, he told me, and he donated all of his personal profits from that tour to a charity. He didn't take anything himself. Imagine that, going all around the world, performing like he does, to the energy he does, and singing and dancing three or four hours a night, all the jet lag, and not earning the penny from me. And he said he was put on earth to make music, entertain, and give back he didn't need the public's approval for what he gave away financially, and he gave away so much. Heal the Kids is about doing something about making a difference in trying to help adults and parents realize that it is our power to change the world that our children live in. But Michael had slowly started to change. He went from his sweet, outgoing young boy to a reclusive, withdrawn man. He was incredibly lonely and troubled. He admitted feeling that he had nobody to talk to. Michael was a paradox, a dreamer, but also down to earth. One side of him was still free, joyful, eccentric, but another side was stuck, broken, uncomfortable. He even confessed to his mom that he felt strange and felt like an animal in a cage. One of the only people Michael thought could understand him was Princess Diana. Michael used to talk to me about Princess Diana a lot. He, he felt she was the only person in the world that could understand his fame and had the level of fame that he had, where he couldn't go out, do anything, was wrongly treated by the media at times, misunderstood. He used to tell me he wanted to marry her. You know, he's his perfect wife. And uh, my, with Michael, you try and tell him he can't do something, then he said, it's got to be done. And they, they had this friendship and bond, and he, he tried to continue it on, but somebody put a stop to it, so uh, it didn't carry on. But he, he was very fond of her. And when, when she died, he was devastated. He canceled some concerts and uh, never really got over it. But it made him wake up a little bit about the danger of the paparazzi yeah, that hit him hard. But he felt she was the only person that would be able to understand him. And they used to have very, very late night conversations that lasted for hours and hours and hours. And of course, this is before my time, but it's just what he used to tell me about her and how much respect he had for her. In the 1990s, his appearance started to change too. Michael began noticing lighter patches on his skin. The media saw this and began printing that he had bleached his skin to become white and that he was trying to be someone he was not. Some African-American psychologists even argued Jackson was a, quote, lousy role model for black youth. The public believed it, unaware that he was suffering from a skin disease called vitiligo, causing the skin to lose melanin and pigmentation and sensitivity to the sun. He became whiter and whiter and rumors were going around but to treat the condition, he had to use fair-colored makeup and skin whitening creams to cover up the discoloration caused by the illness. He couldn't understand this disease, and it made him very sad, especially seeing as people were accusing him of wanting to change the color of his skin. He defended himself multiple times, claiming that he was proud to be black. The skin color thing turned out to be true, yet no one wants to believe it, yet it's in the autopsy report. You know, Michael had vitiligo, and that was that. He had a choice to put up with patches all over his faces or make his skin smooth out white. It, for a long time, he tried covering it up black. His facial structure changed as well over time, followed up by some more speculations around him. The appearance of his nose especially triggered rumors about him doing extensive cosmetic surgery. It is said he had six to change the shape of his nose, though he only admitted two of them and around 10 procedures in total. In June 92, the Daily Mirror described him as hideously disfigured by plastic surgery. While his skin disease certainly wasn't his choice, plastic surgeries were, and we still don't know the real truth behind the reasons why he did them. Oh God, Michael was totally misunderstood by so many people because of the image that he portrayed. Very few people really know the real Michael. The deeply 
sensitive, almost humble guy that he was. In the summer of 1993, his life was turned upside down as he was accused of child abuse at Neverland, which he immediately denied. In the last few weeks, a large amount of ugly, malicious information has been released into the media about me. The information is disgusting and false. All of Michael's accusers has always been about money. In 93, the civil lawsuit filed by the Jordan Chandler family and the um, police report, that was simultaneous. A judge ruled that the civil lawsuit would be heard first. The important one was the criminal one because you could end up in jail. The civil one, it's just about money. It's not that important in the grand scheme of things. But if you're hearing the civil one first, and that could help get you in jail, Michael's team was like, the only option we've got, because the judge ruled the civil one is going to be heard first, is to get rid of it. How do you get rid of it? You have to settle. Jackson settled with the Chandler's family out of court for $25 million. And due to lack of evidence, the case closed. That made Michael look guilty. What is he hiding? Why is he paying off this family? But people don't know the ins and outs of why he was forced to make that settlement. Bottom line is, first case was about money. And once the civil lawsuit was settled for just over $20 million for the whole family, the boy got $15.3 million in a trust fund. They were like, okay, that's it, we're done. Um, we're not gonna testify against Michael Jackson anymore. Once they had their money, they said, we're not interested anymore in the criminal proceedings. If you're a mother or father, surely if something had happened, you would want Michael Jackson to be behind bars. After being publicly humiliated, he became a criminal to the eyes of many, and he adopted an even more reclusive lifestyle. But he always claimed that he was innocent and deeply hurt and humiliated by those terrible allegations. It was a nightmare for him, a storm to live through. The Chandler thing made Michael angry and let down because, you know, by being over-friendly to this boy, he was taken advantage of. I know my kids and my daughter, she's a very smart girl, and she said that if she ever had felt the slightest bit uncomfortable in Michael's presence, she would have shouted it from the rooftops, you know, but there was never any any inappropriate behavior. All his life, he seemed to be drawn to people who took advantage of him. Many of the accusers lied for money before admitting that he actually never molested them. Even some people close to him didn't have his best interest at heart. The few friends that really tried to reach and help him said it was hard for them to get to him. His management at that time was all over the place, different managers, different advisors. And then as the 90s progressed, Michael would affiliate himself with different business partners or, or they would try and affiliate themselves with him. Promise him the moon, because Michael loved movies. So any businessman that could promise Michael, you know, we're gonna make movies together, Michael would be like, yeah, great. So they'd promise him the moon and ultimately not deliver and Michael would invest certain money and never see any of it again. But it was a mess, complete and utter mess. Partly Michael's fault, but they have a duty representing him to have his best interests at heart, and they didn't have their own interests at heart. After a failed marriage with Lisa Marie Presley, daughter of Elvis Presley in 1994, Michael had children in 1997 with a woman named Debbie Rowe, his nurse. He'd always wanted kids, and Debbie offered herself to give Michael children, even though their relationship didn't last either. His children were the world to him, and he was a good father to them. Every time he walked into the room, like, their faces just, like, lit up. The kids would all immediately, like, like a magnet go to him. They'd want to be picked up, they'd want a hug and a kiss. You know, he absolutely adored them. Oh, my God, the, Michael's kids adored him. They would follow him like little ducklings following the mother, mother duck. He was just great, but he had boundaries with his children. They had to go to bed at a certain time. They had a tutor, and they had to have four hours minimum every day of schooling. What I think one thing that really stood out was how 
well brought up the children were. They weren't, I mean, these were children that could probably like have anything that they wanted. But to my core, like, you know, he obviously cared about their education. They never were like bratty in their behavior at all. They were just like so polite and respectful to everyone. You couldn't imagine them um, in a million years, Michael, actually even doing in the slightest bit in anything inappropriate. He also protected his children by making them wear masks so no one knew what they looked like in public. And quite often, some of the times that I went to visit him in Las Vegas, I would take Prince in Paris before Blanket was around. I'd take Prince in Paris out to the local McDonald's. And no one knew who they were. That privacy, you know, putting the masks on his children, he wanted them to be childlike, to be able to do whatever they want without being photographed, without being recognized, so they could remain sort of um, anonymous almost for their entire childhood. In his head, he felt Joseph treated him wrong and he wanted to bring up his children the opposite to, to Joseph. He said that I would never, ever touch any of my children in the way my father did. However, an incident in Berlin made people question his parenthood when he was shown holding his baby over the balcony of his hotel room for the fans to see. This circulated around the world. The press was turning anything he did into something much bigger than it was. And of course, you know, that hit every paper in the world virtually. Michael Jackson, irresponsible father. I mean, for God's sake, he was just holding the kitty up. There was a, a platform underneath. He couldn't have even dropped. The boy would not have plummeted to his death. I mean, he was holding him, you know, he was just showing his kid off. In 2003, he sank deeper and deeper into despair as another sexual abuse accusation was made against him. He was taken to court, but still claimed he was innocent. He was so broken, you know, when it all first came out, he was absolutely devastated. He just couldn't comprehend how people could think that about him. And to be honest, he couldn't comprehend how anyone could even do that to a child, let alone him. So then for those accusations to, you know, be made towards him, he was heartbroken. I don't think he was really the same after. I think he was just a broken man, really. My dad just said, like, it really annoys him when people say that Michael took advantage of them when he was like, anyone could clearly see that they were taking advantage of Michael. He, he had such a big heart and because, you know, it was children that had had, you know, maybe not like the best upbringings, he wanted people to come to Neverland. He wanted them to have this amazing experience. And I think it's quite sad that people must portray that as if you're being kind, you must be preying on people. There must be something sinister behind it. When all he wanted to do was just make people happy. If it was a normal person, if something like that happens, your first reaction isn't to, I must go on TV and talk about it. It's, I need to go to the police. It's like, they don't, I don't feel like they want justice. There's so many contradictions, there's so many mistakes that have been made. If you lie, you've got to remember your lies. So if it happened, then there's a version of events and, and that's it. You don't chop and change it all the time. Michael didn't have a normal upbringing. He didn't get the boundary issue, possibly with some of the sleepovers that he would have had with kids, which would have deemed to be inappropriate to what I'd say, normal society, whatever that is. Michael just didn't get that. He, he couldn't understand why, you know, they were having, it was fun. There was a load of kids there. They were having a party. They were having, watching movies, Disney movies, popcorn, and they were just having a massive sleepover. I think there's a huge stigma attached to anybody who's a little bit different than someone else. The way he looked and appeared to people, they just assumed rather than look for the facts. And, and uh, the facts are that they don't lie and there is no evidence and there never has been. In 2005, he was declared not guilty and completely cleared of all charges. 
It's ironic that Michael was apparently the biggest media manipulator, but at the same time he was naive and this backfired on him. Michael was not just the myth that the media portrayed, he was an extremely empathetic man and an absolute giver. He cared more about people than he cared about himself, but the media didn't show much this part of who he was. It is known that the press wants the bad, not the good. He's been found innocent in a court of law. He's been acquitted of all charges. The FBI investigated him for 10 years. They found absolutely nothing. His Neverland home was raided. But people don't want to hear that because, like I said, pe people just want a villain. And it doesn't, it doesn't make headlines. You know, Michael Jackson, the man that, you know, did loads of for charity, he was such a lovely guy. I just remember Michael as just being a very generous, very kind, very, you know, he'd always listen to what you were saying. It wasn't always about him or what he was doing. In fact, very little. He'd listen an awful lot. And he used to listen to my children, he used to ask them how they were doing at school, you know, what, the, what their favorite subjects were, what they wanted to do when they grew up. And he took a lot of time finding out about what other people and what their interests were. And he was a very, very good father to the point where it used to annoy me the fact that how good a father he was, because it made, used to make me look not such a good dad. To be honest, I think that was the first time that, I, that it really drummed home to me how things can get like twisted and not to always believe mm. what you read. Mm. There was nothing that he'd done, absolutely nothing. No, it was all just that was, made up. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There's an image that the media, I think, want you to have of him. I mean, it, it completely is daggering how much evidence there is to support the fact that he is an innocent man. And people don't want to hear it. They really don't. The hardest is defending him against people that have never met him and they don't know him. Well, that annoys me more than anything, yeah. is people that will say things that have never even met the man. Exactly. It's like, how do you know? You've never exactly. met the guy. You're basing your information on something that you've been told. I struggle to get my head around that. It's, I don't know, I guess it's the way of the world, isn't it, at the moment? People want to, they don't want to hear nice stories. You know, the nice things that Michael used to do in hospitals, and that's never reported. No, of it's course only not. reported to him walking around with a mask on his face or being pushed around the hotel lobby in a wheelchair. One of his favorites was a uh, surgical mask. He'd walk around with it, and they'd be like, oh, what's going on here? You know, why is he wearing a surgical mask? It was for illusion. So he knew kind of a little bit how to play and how to toy with the press, but in other ways, he was incredibly naive. In the late 80s, he went on this little PR campaign to make his career the greatest show on earth. So um, it was all about PR for him. How can I make myself mysterious? How can I, um, how can I be the center of attention? People had this mystified, they were mystified by Michael Jackson. What does this guy do behind closed doors? Um, what is he like? Weird stories about Michael Jackson sold more newspapers. So that was the main reason. The fact that Michael was a bit eccentric helped that. So this mystery persona, I mean, wow, you know, he sleeps in a oxygen chamber. He lives at, on a theme park. His skin color's changed. Yeah, the image and persona that the tabloid press saw of Michael was not the true Michael Jackson. I think because he was different, like he didn't conform to the norm. People didn't like that. There was this, this kind of witch hunt about getting this man because he just didn't conform to how they wanted him to appear. People think they know the myth of Michael Jackson. They all think they know Michael Jackson. He was just a genius, PR media genius. He knew how to manipulate the media. And at the same time, it would backfire on occasions. The frenzy of when he would come out on stage, sometimes he would come out, he would just stay still, like frozen, and wouldn't move. And it was to build curiosity from the crowd.
And he would stay there for anything up to a minute and a half, two minutes, and then he'd do it like a little flick, and everyone would go mad, crazy, because they, they all want to see what's going to happen next. And then he would turn his back on them and then take the mask off, and then he knew exactly. They wanted to see how, what he looked like and the way he looked with makeup and all sorts. He knew that was part of the fascination of the whole Michael Jackson act. Despite being accused of such horrendous crimes, Michael continued to tour. He held on until he couldn't anymore. He had been going through hell. He was a workaholic and he was exhausted. His life as a musician was eclipsed by the endless gossips around his lifestyle. He had control on his life in the beginning, but in 2003, it all started to slip away. There had been too many troubling claims made about him. Stories were made about him that he didn't have any control on. He was used, manipulated, he was a victim, and he was obviously in a lot of pain. The whole court case drained Michael. I mean, I saw him. He wasn't eating. He was getting very, he was just not sleeping particularly well. We were talking to him a lot on the phone, trying to cheer him up. And it was just, it, it was very, very draining for him. He would be weary, he couldn't remember some of the lyrics. Uh, he couldn't do his spins, his dances. He was really, really struggling for many weeks. He was also broke and addicted to antidepressants and strong sedatives, which made him more and more depressed. He'd become physically and emotionally unstable. And Michael started spending quite a bit of money, tens of millions of dollars on all the music videos. All well, the record company would pay for it up front. Michael had to repay that through his royalties. Um, and then he spent 35 million on redoing Neverland. And then of course he had the settlement in 93. And obviously those allegations harmed Michael's career. So slowly um, his finances were in peril. When Michael died, he was uh, $500 million in debt. He was already in debt in the mid nineties when he still had good management. It's partly Michael's fault, but a big part of it is also his management structure, unfortunately. And it was awful, awful for about a decade. Michael says he's been lonely all his life. Um, that he would struggle to make friends because because he's Michael Jackson. That's one of the reasons he had child friends, because they didn't see him as the big superstar. Or if they did, they would soon forget. So Michael described himself as the loneliest man in the world on the whole planet. The pressure that was put on him from as early as he was five up until his last days was enormous and put a huge strain upon him. He was extremely hard on himself. Being a multimillionaire superstar doesn't come without a flip side and burden. I mean, obviously starting to record at the age of five, being on stage at the age of five, that's all he ever knew. He obviously sometimes would resent being thrown into show business at such a young age. He would say he would like to have been given a choice to be a superstar because he can't remember time before not being Michael Jackson, the famous guy. He had to just get on planes all the time and rehearse and uh, go in the recording studio and so on. So his reality is very, very different to us. He never complained about the Jackson Five days, never complained. He just felt like he wished he had a choice and he felt like his dad should have been a little bit easier on him. However, he also used to say all the time, if it weren't for his dad, he wouldn't be where he is now. So he owed a lot to his father, he felt when it led him to be one of the richest people in entertainment ever and to be adored by millions of fans around the world. So that's a great, great privilege. Some of the things that he was able to do in his life with the wealth he had, you know, we would, most of us would all love that. But um, of course we know the flip side to that with Michael Jackson and the burden of that. And there's one story in particular that he would say and um, he was recording with Motown and he was in the studio with his brothers and he could hear 
children playing in the playground opposite. And he just wished that he could just go over there and, you know, be himself, be a child. But he couldn't because he was recording. And there was a time when uh, the brothers were due to go to South America to tour. And um, in the car on the way to the airport, he was just crying because he didn't want to go. You know, he just wanted to stay and be a child, play. But he couldn't do that. I love you. I really do. You have to know that I love you so much. Really, from the bottom of my heart. This is it, and see you in July. In 2009, while preparing for his biggest comeback tour, This Is It, Jackson died from a cardiac arrest due to a fatal dose of propofol that Dr. Conrad Murray, his personal physician, had administered to him. His death was ruled as a homicide and Murray was convicted of involuntary manslaughter and incarcerated. Uh, it was about eight weeks before his death that he started using propofol. Conrad Murray obviously said yes to it. He shouldn't have, and he didn't have the correct equipment to be uh, using that in Michael's home. So for two months, he was sleep deprived. He wasn't eating, he was losing weight. He just wasn't with it. And he was also having Botox and fillers done, you know, preparing himself for getting back on stage appearance wise. And to relieve the pain, he would be on Demerol. So he was taking Demerol and Propofol at the same time for about two months, which is just, you're not going to be in tip top shape. Physically, just wasn't in the condition to be able to do 50 days. We had like over an hour long conversation. Uh, Michael sounded like he was drunk or he was, well, I guess he was drugged, but he just didn't sound right. Worryingly not right. When people leave the show, when people leave my show, when I want to say, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I think Michael was possibly close to cancelling the whole tour. He was just absolutely exhausted. He was terrified about This Is It, and also tears in his eyes that he sold so many concerts so quickly. And um, all he was concerned about was his children. And he looked at Mark and said, I don't know how the public are going to receive me after the trial. He, he really felt people felt differently about him after the trial. He could sense that. Um, in fact, it was the first time too after, after the trial we would hear negative comments being shouted at him when we were bodyguarding him too. And he said, if anything happens to my children, Mark, you're their godparent. Make sure you look after them. Ever since I was born, Daddy has been the best father you could ever imagine. <laughs> and I just wanted to say I love him so much. <laughs> Michael's death was a shock to everyone. It triggered a global outpouring of grief, and a live broadcast of his public memorial was viewed all around the world. He continued to help even after his death, directing his estate in his will to donate 20% of all future earnings to various charities. It kept changing. They were saying that he was okay, he was in, he was in a coma, um, and then I think one by one, Everyone is sort of was confirming that he'd passed away. Yeah. And I was like, I was glued to the TV. Didn't accept it until every single channel had sort of said that they well, we were just hoping that it was going to be. I, I was really days. hoping it was like always like a 
bad practical joke. Yeah. That's what I was We were hoping, hoping. that it was, it was actually, no, he's, he, he hasn't died. I was, so I was only 17 when he passed. And I think I'd love for him to be here now and just be able to have conversations with him about stuff now, now that I'm, I suppose now that I'm more aware of this, you know, the like, the pop icon status that he had. I miss Michael a lot. My kids miss him. They miss his kids. It's just such a shame that the, the man isn't around with us. He's, he's, a, he's a great, great loss to the world, really, but absolutely the most misunderstood man. The public need to open their minds a little bit to see that this man is a genuine guy and you don't just wake up one day in Gary, Indiana and, and become the most successful man on earth. He was an intelligent, smart guy, not some comic figure that people seem to think he is. And that uh, intelligence is not shown and having to deal with stuff that's been dealt with. 10 years for the FBI, child services, and a trial by the hardest cult in the world, by a man who really wanted to put me in jail, Tom Snedden, you know, really, and tried everything. And uh, millions and millions of dollars trying to jail him, so. But he never really recovered from that. That broke his heart. He's a good entertainer. Oh, he's, <laughs> he's out of this world. There's God, then there's Michael. <laughs> Michael never really wanted to grow up, and he lived a controversial life. His sudden death left behind a string of unanswered questions, questions that may never be answered. He was a once-in-a-lifetime entertainer, but despite the heights of his career, he struggled with private problems that had repercussions on his health. He fell into the wrong hands and never received the help he needed. We know what Peter Pan represents, um, never growing up, staying childlike forever. Michael, in adulthood, sees himself as Peter Pan. And uh, you've obviously got Never Never Land and uh, the ranch being called Neverland. After Michael died, people were willing to celebrate his music again, who he was. There's a saying, isn't it, that um, you only appreciate something really when it's gone. And after Michael died, no one was really talking about that anymore. The allegations, the plastic surgery, and, I mean, it was being spoken about, but ultimately it was back to Michael Jackson, the performer. Michael Jackson passed away before we could slip on stage while doing the moonwalk. He once said that, you know, I, I hate to see people grow old. I hate to see the way Fred Astaire can no longer dance the way he used to dance. And he would often talk about this, um, you know, trying to evade death. Uh, he never said, you know, I want to die young, but he did say, I don't want to grow old. He would say, in a way, I will never die because I've binded myself to my music and I want my music to last forever. And if it does, then I will never, ever die. He's forever young. Who was Michael Jackson? One of a kind. Um, we'll never see the like of him again. Um, we'll never see a star that big again. Um, people wanting to know about him. Um, the level of media coverage. Uh, the mysteriousness of him. Uh, you know, Paul McCartney, John Lennon, all these other legends, you know, they don't have all the unique aspects that Michael Jackson had. It's a really tough question, who he was, other than the most talked about person in the world, probably the most famous person in the world that's ever existed. Um, when Michael talks about the song Childhood from the History album, he says, our personal history begins in childhood, and the song Childhood is a reflection of my life. It's about the pain, some of the joys, some of the dreaming, 
some of the mental adventures that I took because of the different lifestyle I had in being a child performer. I was born on stage and childhood, it's my mirror, it's my story. He was a true artist, a phenomena, a myth. But the real Michael, the man in the mirror, was misunderstood and an enigmatic figure of intense conflict and self-destruction. Mm -hmm.